All right, well today we have reached a pivotal point in our uh, series that we've been in where we've just been walking through a collection of Jesus' most famous teaching called the Sermon on the Mount. Um, Today we're actually reaching the end of Matthew chapter six and I know I told you we spent over two months in Matthew chapter five and I I told you we would speed up as we went through and I'm holding good on that promise. So we are gonna reach the end of Matthew chapter six. That's the good news. Um, Here's the bad news, just wanna pull the curtain back on how sermon planning goes. Um, this is really part one of, of, or sorry, this is part two of last week's message. We're continuing on the same theme. So I had a choice to make. I had like 20 extra minutes for last week's teaching that I could have added on, but I didn't want to do that to you. And so we're, we'll probably have a shorter message today. We're going to have some extended time with Jesus at the end. Um, but, but if you have questions at all, feel free to text those in. So if you weren't here last week, the theme theme that Jesus is hitting on is how do we handle our wealth, our possessions, our money, all the stuff that makes us uncomfortable to talk about in church. And, um, you know, I was thinking this week, there's an illustration I've used before, but I just think it's so apt to what we're talking about. Um, If you remember from your world history class about the Crusades, uh, that was a period in church history where the church and government had kind of aligned themselves together. And whenever that happens, only bad things result. In fact, uh, the theologian Tony Campolo says, um, mixing church and the government is like mixing ice cream and poop, okay? It doesn't ruin the poop but it does mess up the ice cream. And and so sometimes when the church and government collude together, the church ends up doing some pretty bad things in the name of Jesus. And so during this time period, you have the church is going to war against people of the Islamic faith. And because this is church and government sponsored, um, you can really say like, this is a holy war. That's what people were told. Now, at a certain point, uh, you run out of uh, Christians to enlist in the army. And so the church uh, hires mercenaries. But again, if you're going to be a part of this holy war, you have to claim faith in Jesus. So this is how the legend goes. I don't know if it's historically accurate or not, but they would have these mass baptisms where you'd have these mercenaries would come in all their armor and they would be baptized. But as they went under the water, they held their sword above their heads out of the water as if to say, I'm going to follow Jesus, but I am not going to be doing some very Jesus-y things with this sword. So I'm going to follow him, but there's some area of my life that I'm not actually going to trust him with. And I think it's so apt because for all of us, at least for me, there's certainly areas in my life that I like to keep above the water. Like, I'll follow you, Jesus, but don't tell me what to do with my career goals and ambitions. I'll follow you, Jesus, but don't tell me how to live and and love and operate in my marriage. I'll follow you, Jesus, but don't tell me what to do with my finances. And so I think that's the thing that stands out to me. Why does Jesus have this long section right here in the middle of this teaching dealing with wealth and possessions? It's because for Jesus, there's no area of our lives that are off limits. He wants to be the Lord of every area of our life, even in finances. And so we're going to lean back into it today. Um, By way of recap for what we talked about last week, I just want to look back at one verse we talked about briefly, but I want to take a moment to expand on it. Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. In this section on teaching we looked at last week, Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, growing up, when I read this, I would read it like, um, where your heart is, that's where your treasure is. So well, whatever you love about, that's what you're going to invest in. So if you love your marriage, you're going to invest in it. And if you, you know, love your house, you're going to invest in it. And while I think there's certainly truth to that, that's not what Jesus is saying. He doesn't say where your heart is, that's where your treasure is. He says where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Like, how do we invest and take what God has given us, how we invest and use that in the world shapes the direction of our heart. For example, uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with a few years ago, uh, the GameStop stock incident. Anybody remember this? So if you're not familiar, GameStop is a brick and mortar store that sells video games. Um, Most video games now, people just buy digitally. So it's basically like blockbuster in the world of Netflix. And so a couple years ago, you have these big hedge funds who basically make a gamble that GameStop's gonna go out of business. So they short the stock. They're hoping that it folds. And at the same time, you have a bunch of uh, retail investors. That's, you know, Wall Street code for people like you and me who just might invest for fun. They start buying 
buying the stock to drive up the price and to make these hedge funds lose money. And so you go back and forth for several weeks. The stock goes from under $20 to over $400 a share in just a matter of weeks. And so some people are making millions. Some people are losing millions. And I'll be honest with you, as your pastor, please don't judge me. But uh, there was a moment during that two-week period where I purchased some GameStop stock. And uh, that drastically shaped how my days unfolded. Because for about a two-week stretch there, my off day is Friday, um, we'd put the kids on the bus, send them off to school, I would grab my coffee, sit down, and turn on CNBC, right? Like, I'm just, the morning squawk, whatever it is, I'm just like, we got to track the market, and we got to know where it's a short squeeze, and I'm learning all this stuff, and I've got my computer pulled up, and I'm trying to figure out, okay, when do we get out? So for a couple of weeks, all of my heart and focus is on what this stock is doing. Why? Is it because I love GameStop? No, I don't think I've ever bought anything from GameStop. But my money was invested in it, and so my heart was invested in it. And the whole point of what Jesus was making last week is not that having wealth or material possessions or money is wrong or evil. It's not whether or not we have it that's bad. It's how do we hold it? Are we using it for ourselves, or will we leverage it for God's kingdom? Is it all about us, our comfort, our hopes, our dreams, our desires, or will we see that all of this belongs to, to Jesus and we're just going to use it in support of his mission? Does that make sense? All right, so that's all recap from last week. This week, Jesus is going to take a slightly different approach. So last week, we talked about, you know, you have wealth or abundance of possessions. You know, when you own more stuff, you, there's more concern. There can be more stress, more anxiety. As the late 20th century philosopher, notorious B.I.G., put it, mo' money, mo' problems, right? So Jesus is addressing that last week. We have all this stuff. It can produce an anxiety or a fear in us. But there's also the flip side of that is, what if you don't have any of that? Because doesn't that uh, produce anxiety and stress in our lives as well? So that's what Jesus has in mind when we jump in this morning, Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? Can any of you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? And why do you worry about your clothes? Observe how the wildflowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin thread. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was adorned like one of these. And if that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't he do much more for you, you of little faith? So don't worry saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Now, I know that was a lot. And this is a big section that we're working through. But I wanted to read it all at once to see that there's this constant theme that Jesus is repeating over and over and over again. It's do not worry about even the things you need. He says, do not worry about your life. Now, certainly, we, we read this and on face value. Is, it's almost as if Jesus is saying, eh, d don't worry about anything. God will take care of you. And, and we could definitely twist this for our own selfish needs. Because I could say, you know what? I really want to live at the beach, so I'm going to quit my job, sell everything I have, move down to the beach. I'm not going to work. I'm just going to live every day in my chair, and God will take care of me. And, and I think what Jesus would say to that is sometimes the way God takes care of you is when you get a job and you work and you do the financially responsible things. Like Jesus is not telling us to be foolish and unwise. But what is he saying? He's saying not to worry or to stress. Now, most of the New Testament is written in Greek. And the Greek word for worry here has the idea of a, of a focus on something that produces anxiety or like a, a hyper focus that brings all of this emotional turmoil, which I find interesting because who is Jesus talking to? You have to rewind your brain several months to the very beginning of this series. We didn't actually start in Matthew chapter five. We started in Matthew chapter four. And if you remember at the end of Matthew chapter four, what is Jesus doing? He's traveling around, he's teaching, he's healing people, 
He's casting out demons, and all of these people start to follow Jesus. Now, again, Jesus is a first century Jewish rabbi. And in first century Jewish culture, people who had been chronically sick or had some kind of spiritual oppression were viewed as unclean, which meant they could not go and worship God. They could not go to the temple. They could not have a relationship with him. Not only that, but in first century Jewish culture, the rest of the community would have looked at these people as being um, contagious, so to speak, like spiritually contagious. Their unholiness was going to rub off on me. So not only were they cut off from God, they were cut off from the community as well. Which interesting side note, it seems to me that everywhere Jesus goes, he's spreading his holiness to the people who'd been told their entire lives that they were unclean and unrighteous. Now it's these people who've been healed, who've who've had demons cast out, what, what can they now do? Now that they're clean, they can go worship. They can be with the community. Jesus is restoring them. And it's those people that Jesus looks at and he says, you're blessed. You who are poor in spirit, you who are meek, you who, who are peacemakers, right? He's not, he's not the, the be blessed does a reminder. It's not be these things. He's looking at these people who have nowhere else to turn, but Jesus. And he said, you're blessed because you have nothing to offer. And when you have nothing to offer, you have nothing to lose. When you reach the end of yourselves, you're finally able to enter into God's kingdom. So so they have nothing. So now what is Jesus warning them? Don't worry, hyper fixate on all of these material things in the world, because what is that going to do? It's going to distract you from following Jesus. The way we might say this is your focus determines your direction. Um, I don't know if you guys follow me on social media. I'm one of the most boring people to follow. I rarely post, but if you have, you may have noticed that for Mother's Day, I gave what I believe to be the best Mother's Day gift I have ever given. My wife got two electric scooters, all right? Now, that might sound lame to you, but these things go over 20 miles an hour. They're fun. The whole family's zipping through the neighborhood. And and what I learned, I, I got on them, and I'm probably more scared than anybody in my family to get on this thing. And you get on it, and I don't know how you are, but for me, I'm like so nervous. I'm just like, like looking right in front of me, just don't tip over, don't fall. But what do you have to do? At some point, you have to fix your gaze up so you can see what's coming ahead of you. I don't know if you've ever ridden an electric scooter before. They don't turn really well, okay? They don't have a turning radius. They have a a turning diameter, okay? That's a little math joke for you math nerds here today. So you have to look up. You have to see, because wherever you look, that's where you're going to go. If you look behind you, what happens? You start to turn in that direction. And in the same way, Jesus is warning his followers that if your focus shifts from Jesus onto material possessions, onto your house, your car, I would throw career goals and ambitions and aspirations in there as well. It will distract you from following Jesus. A phrase my wife says, and I'm going to steal it from her. She says, what you focus on expands. And so I shared last week, my car got totaled. So I had to go through the whole car shopping experience. I was thinking about just using the electric scooter. I hate you. I hate shopping for cars. It's not fun. But, but I had narrowed it down to like three types of cars I wanted to get. And has this ever happened to you? All of a sudden, I notice those three cars everywhere I go because I've been focusing on it. That's what I've been looking for. And all of a sudden, I start to find what I'm looking for. But if your life is full of stress and anxiety, could it be that you spend so much time looking on the stuff around you instead of looking at the one who's blessed you with it? Like, could we fix our focus on Jesus? That's what he's getting at. He says, don't worry. Don't hyper fixate on these things. Now, there are a couple instances where this word worry is used positively, but the vast majority of times it shows up in scripture it shows up in a negative aspect, like do not worry and don't hyper fixate and get anxiety over stuff. And one of the most famous examples of this is a story found in Luke chapter 10. So I do want to flip over there real quick. If you've grown up in church, you have heard this story a million times. So I don't have any new insights to offer, but maybe just remind you of a few things that are in this passage. So we're going to jump in Luke chapter 10, verse 38. It says, while they were traveling, so Jesus and his disciples, he, meaning Jesus, entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. And she had a sister named Mary, who also sat at the Lord's feet and was listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, and she came up and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? So tell her to give me a hand. And the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things. 
But one thing is necessary. Mary has made the right choice and it will not be taken away from her. So get this picture in your mind. Jesus and his disciples, they're traveling. I think it's worth pointing out. Was Jesus a homeowner? No, Jesus was homeless. He didn't, he didn't, have, he didn't own anything. And so he completely relied on the hospitality of other people. So as he's traveling through this town, this woman named Martha wants to have Jesus in her home. Is this a good thing? Yes, it's a good thing. She wants to serve Jesus, have him in her home. So Jesus comes over. And so she starts doing all the things you have to do to be a good hostess. And she's trying to take care of this and that and the other. And we learn that she has a sister, Mary, who's sitting at Jesus' feet. It's important to know, because remember, Jesus is a first century Jewish rabbi. And the people who would sit at a Jewish rabbi's feet were his disciples. It was the people who were trying to learn and become more like him. So Mary has positioned herself as a disciple, a follower of Jesus, which in that day is pretty radical that a woman would be allowed to sit at the feet of a rabbi and to learn from him. And so Martha's looking over at Mary, who seems to be pretty selfish, right? Like I'm getting all this work done. I'm taking care of things. I'm setting the table. I'm doing all this. And she's just sitting there and she's doing nothing. You ever have this moment in your family? You're getting ready for something? This a uh, this is just my experience, okay? I will be sitting on the couch blissfully unaware that anything is going on, and then suddenly I realize my wife has been cleaning and maybe not so happy that I have been dirtying things up right behind her. And so here Martha's looking at Mary thinking, come on and help me. And I find it interesting that Martha doesn't go to Mary. Who does she go to? She goes to Jesus. Jesus, come on, talk to your girl Mary here. Tell her she needs to help me take care of all of this stuff. And what does Jesus say? Jesus says, you are worried. You have worked yourself up into this anxious frenzy about many things, but the only thing that's important in this moment is to sit at my feet. I find it interesting. It says that Martha was distracted, right? She had Jesus in her house. The appropriate response would be to sit with Jesus, to listen to his teaching, to allow it to shape and transform her. But she was too busy doing things for Jesus that she didn't spend time with Jesus. We can be distracted by many things. We can be distracted by good things. But ultimately, if we're not focused on Jesus, we're still distracted from the only things that actually matter. And I wonder if maybe some of us are here today and you're starting to realize where your focus has been, some of the things that have been a part of your life, that they may be good, but they're not what God wants. So maybe there's some good things that are distracting you from the main thing. So when that happens, Martha's worried. And Jesus, Matthew chapter 6, says, don't worry. Don't lose focus. Don't get caught up in all the things of this world. And I find it interesting, the examples he gives, he's talking about birds, he's talking about flowers. You know, I can't miss a Sunday without going back to Genesis, right? So if you go to Genesis in the Garden of Eden, God puts Adam and Eve, and he says, I want you to be my images, to reflect my glory into the world. And how are they supposed to do that? They were to work in creation and watch over creation. They had this authority over creation, not to abuse it or to use it for their own benefit, but to care for it. And so Jesus is really making this argument from the lesser to the greater. He says, you know, those birds that you're supposed to care for and steward, well, they don't plant things, do they? They don't get out in the garden and pull the weeds and they're not, you know, pulling the hose over to make sure it's getting enough water. No, God provides for them. So if he provides for the things you're supposed to have authority over, over, then wouldn't he provide for you as well? Or or look at the flowers in the field. Look at how beautiful they are. If God brings all of their beauty, do you think God would neglect you a good thing as well? In fact, I find it interesting. The temptation we fall into, or at least I fall into, over and over again, is we doubt the goodness of God. Right? That's what Adam and Eve doubted. They they, uh, said, you can eat from any tree, even the tree of life, and live forever. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the the temptation they faced was God's holding out on us. He hasn't given us every good thing. And I think sometimes it's so easy to live in a world where we say, I believe in God and I trust him to provide for me. We say that, but we live as if we have to depend on ourselves and provide for ourselves. And so here, Jesus is reminding us, listen, if God will take care of the lesser things, he will take care of you as well. And I love that phrase, how many of you by worrying can add one moment to your life? 
I don't know, like sometimes my, my podcast feed is pretty random. I got everything from sports, pop culture, movies, theology, it's all in there. But then there's some of them that every once in a while they pop up and there's this uh, theme of biohacking. Are you guys familiar with this? It's like how to optimize your body, right? So we're talking, you know, saunas and cold plunges and sleep tracking and all that stuff. And listen, I am all for like stewarding our body well, but you can do all of that and, you know, uh, not to be morbid, you can do all of that and tomorrow you could get hit in a car accident and your life could be over. Like, we can stress and worry and do all this stuff, but do we actually even have control to add one more moment to our life? We don't have as much control in this world as we think that we do. And so we really have to continually position ourselves just like Jesus' first followers. I have nothing to offer, and so I'm here to enter into the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is consistent by saying, don't worry don't worry, don't worry. But I don't know if you've ever been stressed and someone comes up to you and says, ah, don't stress about it. It's like, that's the least helpful thing you can say to somebody, right? Like I'm stressed and you telling me not to be stressed is only gonna make me more stressed. But thankfully, Jesus doesn't just say, don't worry about it. He gives us the antidote to worry. What does he say? He says, instead of focusing on all of the possessions, the things around us, seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. And if you seek that first, then guess what? God will provide everything for you. He's a good God. And if we put him first, if we put the things of God first, he will take care of all the things we need. So he's saying, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. I think that's, like, what does that mean? That's a very flowery phrase, but I think sometimes we forget what it actually means. Remember, what is God's kingdom? This is the simplest way I can put it. It's God's people living God's way. So so to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness means all this stuff we've been walking through, Jesus telling us how to live our lives, if our focus is on becoming the people that Jesus has called us to be, he will take care of everything else. He will provide for us. He will meet our needs. So so we're not going to miss out on any good thing as long as we put God first in our lives. And then he says, you know, tomorrow has enough worries. So again, I don't think Jesus is saying be unwise and don't have a plan. You know, he's not saying don't have a savings account. That's not the point he's making. But sometimes I can get so focused worrying what's going to happen next week or next month or next year that I've already lost my focus on how to follow Jesus today. What he's called us to is to just sit with him, to follow him moment by moment, day after day. Now, what does it practically look like to do this? We've got three thoughts, and if you've been at Bridgepoint for a while, you will see these are not original. This is stuff you've all heard before, but I love when I get an opportunity to remind us of it again. Because here at Bridgepoint, we're about three things, and these are the three things I'm going to give you. How do you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness? The first one is actually be with Jesus. I know it's shocking that we should actually be with Jesus, but, but this is, goes back to that story of Martha and Mary. I, I'm, I'm a fix it, get it done kind of person. Like my idea of relaxing is like pressure washing a fence, okay? Like I'm just gonna do stuff. But I think I can get so distracted doing all this other stuff, I actually forget the things where I'm supposed to be sitting with Jesus. And, and I know it sounds like basic and elementary. So when I teach, I'm really not teaching you anything new. Hopefully I'm just reminding you of things that you heard before and maybe forgot along the way. But, but I am so big on starting every day with Jesus. When I was in student ministry, you know, helping students to try to implement some spiritual practices, the big question is, well, do I have to do this in the morning? It's like, well, there's no scripture or verse that says like, yes, you need to spend the first 15 minutes with God every single day. Okay, it's not, it's not a sin not to, but I just think it's wise to do that because I've noticed how I start my day shapes my mindset headed into the day. So if the first thing I do is pick up my phone and start on my email, then I just get in work mode right away. If I pick up my phone and I start scrolling social media, all of a sudden I become hyper aware of what are other people doing and what are other people thinking about me? If I turn on the news, I'm just stressed like right out of the gate in the morning. So what if instead, we, we, listen, if we wanna follow Jesus, it costs us something. What if the only thing it cost you was to set your alarm 15 minutes earlier? I mean, that's not persecution, right? Like that's a simple step we can take to follow Jesus. And I've shared this before. Um, I'm on this journey of implementing different spiritual practices in my life. Um, but there was a time period where I was really focused on silence and solitude. So I would get up in the morning and I would get my coffee and I would read some scripture. And then I just wanted to sit in my living room in silence with Jesus. So the way that looked, I would sit in a chair and I would just imagine Jesus sitting in the couch next to me and just sit in silence. So I'm not praying. 
I'm not doing anything. I'm just sitting in silence. And I am, just to be honest with you, I'm a very bad Christian. Because in five minutes, my mind would wander five million different times. And I'm thinking about the to-do list and the grocery store and all this stuff at work and everything else. But in those moments, I would become aware of that. I would redirect my thoughts back to Jesus and just say, thank you for welcoming me back. Now, five minutes, that is a long time. Okay, I thought that that was going to be easy. That is a very difficult thing to do. But what I started noticing is when I was spending the first part of my day focused on Jesus being with me, then I started to notice him showing up in other places as well. And sometimes at the most inopportune times when I'm arguing with my spouse and then I become aware that Jesus is there and then I probably need to be quiet. Or when I'm frustrated at the grocery store because the people in front of me won't move quick enough and I remember Jesus is standing right here. Or when I'm stressed over things at work or, or with kids and I then am calm because I remember, guess what, Jesus is here. And I think it's so important for us to cultivate this, this attitude, this, this lifestyle of being with Jesus. Because there's so many things in this life that clamor for our attention. What I've noticed is Jesus doesn't ever try to be the loudest voice in the room. In fact, it's brilliant. Because if you have kids, I don't know if you've noticed this. All right, we have three boys. Our house is loud, like 100 decibels from morning until night. And so if my wife and I are trying to talk and yelling back and forth, but the, we can barely hear each other. But the moment we try to whisper something to each other, the house gets dead silent and everybody said, what did you just say? And I wonder if for some of us, Jesus is just that whisper voice. And he said, I'm not going to compete with this other stuff. I'm going to wait till you're ready. And so would we start every day being ready to be with Jesus? Now, when we're with Jesus, the natural next step then is to become like Jesus. And again, easier said than done. None of these are like three steps you're going to go home and apply this afternoon and knock it out of the park. But when we are with Jesus, we start to actually become more like him, which requires us to do the things Jesus did. This is why at Bridgepoint, huge on spiritual practices. And not just prayer and scripture reading, though I think those are great, but silence and solitude, Sabbath, confession, worship, generosity. Because when we do these things, they start to shape and change us to actually become more like him. I say this all the time, but I think it bears repeating. The goal of doing the spiritual, the goal of reading your Bible is not to be great at reading your Bible. It's to become more like Jesus. And the goal of prayer is not to get really good at praying, is to become more like Jesus. And the goal of, of confessing is not to get really good at confessing, but so that we would become more like Jesus. And so would we be willing to implement those practices in our lives so that we would actually become more like him? I know, we're almost done. I promise. We'll be out of here in a second. Um, man, I just lost my train of thought because I was making a dumb joke. All right, here we go. We're back on track. Becoming more like Jesus. What was I going to say? Kale, I don't know. I don't know what I was going to say. It'll occur to me this afternoon, and I'll put it on my Instagram. You can follow me on Instagram for it. As we become more like Jesus, though, what we are going to find is that, oh, I remember what it was. All right, here we go. Thank you, Jesus. So I've been guilty of saying stuff like this before. Like, following Jesus, you know, it's, it's not about behavior. Uh, it's about heart transformation. But the reality is, if Jesus is changing your heart, your behavior is probably going to change as well. And so this is a question I just keep coming back to over and over again. The more that I walk with Jesus, the more I realize I'm asking less and less, is this a sin? And more and more, is this thing going to help me become more like Jesus? So is watching Netflix for 24 straight hours, is that a sin? I don't know, but is that helping me become more like Jesus? Probably not. You know, I was listening to certain types of music. Is it a sin? No. Is it helping me become more like Jesus? I don't know. See, these are the questions I think we need to wrestle with. Are the things in our lives helping us become more like Jesus or less like Jesus? And then, of course, as we become more like Jesus, the last step then is we'll be sent by Jesus. Again, he's not just like trying to get us in a room together and have an emotional worship experience and go home and come back and do it again next week. Here's what I know. You're going to be sent somewhere, right? Today, some of us are going to be sent to the Mexican restaurant, Right? Tomorrow, you're going to be sent to your work. Some, some of you might be sent on a vacation, but you're being sent somewhere. 
And that's such an important thing to realize because if we float through life thinking that life is just happening to us, then we're never going to be intentional to do the things that Jesus did. But if we understand that we were sent by Jesus with a purpose to bring heaven to earth, then what we realize is we cannot do in the world what Jesus has not done in our hearts. And so again, I said, that's the goal. That's the direction we want to move. But can I be honest? Sometimes we want to be sent by Jesus. We want to do big things for God but we haven't taken the step of becoming like Jesus. And for some of us, we haven't become like Jesus because we're not actually spending time with Jesus. So we have to spend time with him to become like him so we can be sent by him. Now, at this point, I am going to throw it open to Q&A. So we did not get any text in questions. So if you want to ask a question, this is kind of our ground rules. Let it be relevant to what we've talked about today. Let it be quick, clear, and a question, not a comment. So if you have a question, you want to raise your hand. I'll be glad to offer some kind of response. Can't, can't promise it'll be good, but it'll be a response. So anybody going once, going twice. All right. So here's what I want to do, and here's kind of how I want to end our time together. I'm just so big on the be with Jesus part because I think it's so easy. It's easy for me to be doing stuff for Jesus and forget to spend time with him. And I would love to believe that all of you are going to wake up tomorrow and spend the first hour of your day in prayer and scripture reading. And, but the reality is, for most of us, that's not the shape of our life. The reality is, for some of us, this is the only time this week that we're spending intentional time with him. That, by the way, is why we have communion and prayer time every single week. It's not because I grew up doing that, because certainly didn't. The reason is because we just want to make sure every week we have time together with Jesus. And so I'm going to pray, and our communion stations will be open. Our prayer stations will be open, too. You can write a prayer to God and put it in the prayer jar or light a candle because throughout church history, it's represented offering a prayer to God. But in this time together, maybe the simple question that you need to wrestle with is, Jesus, what am I still holding above the water? Or maybe it's, Jesus, what is distracting me? from doing the things you've called me to do. Or maybe for some of you, it's just to sit there and imagine him sitting next to you so that you become more aware of his presence and that when we leave here, we're aware of his presence in the car and at home and tomorrow when we go to work. But in this moment, let this be time you spend with him. So all across this room, would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Jesus, we're so thankful. We're thankful that you don't just expect us to get this right away, but that you're willing to go on this journey with us of shaping us and changing us. And I pray even right now in this moment that we would sit with you and you would meet us here. And that there's things that we've been holding back from you. We would surrender it. That there's things that have been distracting us that you would make us aware of it but that in this moment we'd feel your presence and you'd help us to become more like you. It's in your name I pray. Amen.